it's always the erosion of material conditions and people getting angry about said realities this creating a perfect environment to like focus your efforts on something else an external force and that's how nationalism and fascist fervor rises great video video on how western germany preserved fascism in germany post world war ii so uh bestie marx is incredible and i've told him that I want to watch his videos on on the show. The problem is that there's a lot of TOS in it. I don't know if this has TOS in it. We we've had we've had conversations about like some of the violent uh, imagery that Bez D Marks happens to show. I don't know if this one has it or not. But we can we can uh, go through this a little bit. Yeah, how Nazism survived in Germany. <laughs> Classic. He said nobody was killed in Auschwitz. Let me re clear let me say this clearly. Unfortunately, no one was killed, which is the typical neo-Nazi take. Okay? Does this guy write for Politico? Who knows? Now, of course, the Politico writer is simply a collaborator. Maybe aligns with the uh ideologies of the Nazis, maybe doesn't care. Uh, but this guy is out and about. It's a little different. <laughs> The destruction of Nazism with its roots is our slogan. The building of a new world of peace and freedom is our goal. Oath of Buchenwald, which uh, survivors of the concentration camp took after liberation on April 11, 1945. In the slipstream of the capitalist crisis and with the support of crucial parts of the state itself, Nazism has been growing stronger in the Federal Republic of Germany almost unhindered for several years. Hang the Nobel Prize around Adolf Hitler's uh, head? What? The far right AFD party with openly fascist elements is growing quickly and establishing itself as a dominant player nationwide. Parts of the right are talking more frequently about fascist coups or the Rassenkrieg, the race war, and their entanglements deep into the state apparatus are becoming public again and again. The increasing right-wing terror against migrants and other minorities creates a climate of fear and insecurity. Meanwhile, the state is ramping up its repression against those fighting against Nazism to suffocate rising awareness and resistance in its infancy. Some weeks... Yeah, the music is a little loud. The audio mixing, unfortunately, goes a little heavy. Um, but it's a great video. Uh, Bezzy Marx does a lot of good videos. Anti-fascist Lina E received over five years for alleged attacks against neo-Nazis. And this after a series of revelations showing the complicity of the state in the creation of a secret far-right network. In order to understand the developments in Germany, it is crucial to know about how and why Nazism managed to stay alive, and therefore to learn about the so-called period of denazification after World War II, where, far from eliminating Nazi influence, Nazism was deliberately spared and reintegrated into the new West German power structure. Where yeah, if only there was like a Western force that, um, you know, that that basically took over Western Germany and and uh, reinstituted pin post to follow original creator. Have we not? We usually do pin a, a post, but yes, this is Bestie Marks, uh, who's great. If only there was a, like a Western force that, uh, you know, came over and was like, hey, we should put Nazis back in power because they're really fucking sick at uh, hating commies as much as we do. Where it managed to survive. We made the simple mistake. We made the same mistake with the Confederacy. That was not a mistake. Neither of those cases were a mistake, and it especially was not a mistake uh, in, uh, in, in the aftermath of World War II. It was not a mistake at all. It was by design. It was intentional. It was certainly not a mistake in uh, in the Civil War either, in Reconstruction, where it was white supremacy. White supremacy is not a mistake. It is a way of existence. 
if you have white supremacist attitudes, if you are growing up in a white supremacist nation, okay, and you have these values in your core, you are going to, you are absolutely uh, going to be infinitely more fearful of black people seeking out revenge, right, during the Reconstruction era than uh, the fragile white people who were actually uh, showing violent retribution and an unwillingness to cooperate even after they got fucking, even after they got their shit pushed in and capitulating to those white slave owners was deliberate. Even if you did not fully agree with them ideologically on the necessity of, of chattel slavery, you still had similar values so much so that you did not consider it to be genuinely a problem to reinstitute the same racial hierarchy with maybe a little bit more legal hurdles uh, slapped on top of it. Because that is precisely what happened. To this day, Before I start, I just want to quickly say a huge thank you to all those who support the channel on Patreon, which I set up after my last video on Turkish fascism. Doing all the research and editing takes up a huge amount of time and your contributions really make a difference. His, I, I want to watch his video on NATO and Turkish ultranationalist fascism and how America played a formative and significant role it's basically a carbon copy of this, I suspect. I haven't watched this video yet, but I assume it's the same, like, NATO-backed elements uh, that America put in positions of power and offered uh, support to, because that's what happened in Turkey. The ultranationalists uh, rose up and got funding and training and help from, under, under NATO, of course, uh, got funding and help and training from America. Most people have heard about the top Nazi leaders such as Hermann Göring and Rudolf Hess being prosecuted after the defeat of Nazi Germany in the famous Nuremberg trials. What is less well known is that West German denazification was an utter failure when it comes to thoroughly punishing Nazis in the several trials that were conducted at the time. From 1946 until 2005, after absorbing the GDR, the Federal Republic of Germany convicted 6,656 people of Nazi crimes, and the vast majority of sentences, just under 5,000, were relatively mild, involving imprisonment of up to two years. Note that this is a teeny tiny fraction of the over 200,000 perpetrators of Nazi crimes. Picture this. The number of individuals convicted for Nazi crimes under the Federal Republic was lower than the total number of Nazis who had worked at Auschwitz alone. Up until the end of the 20th century, only 164 Nazis were eventually sentenced for murder compared to the hundreds of thousands of individuals complicit in the massacre of 6 million Jews in the Holocaust. And I want you to keep in mind that anti-fascist Lina A got over five years in prison for allegedly beating up Nazis, while the vast majority of those convicted, literal participants in the Nazi killing machine didn't even receive two years. The half-assed denazification efforts didn't cause outrage among all people in Germany. If anything, a considerable amount of the population who remained in denial about the Nazi crimes opposed these efforts, dismissing the Nuremberg trials conducted by foreign powers as victor's justice. Germany was once again portrayed as the victim. This is no surprise, since a large section of the German population had been supporters of Hitler. 43.9% had voted for the Nazi party in 1933 with some estimating an even higher percentage of support in the 40s. And they did not turn anti-fascist all of a sudden after the war. Before the state pushed for amnesty a few years later, it was a large section of civil society that helped the Nazis with legal assistance or with smuggling them out of the country. It was the Catholic and the Protestant churches that represented one of the few structural constants immediately after the war ended. The International Red Cross provided the fleeing Nazis with passports. Among those who left illegally were Adolf Eichmann, one of the main arch- Wait, I mean, I, I mean, uh...
the answer to the question, why are there so many German last names in, uh, you know, Argentina? And uh, why does, why does great granddad claim that he came before World War II, but it doesn't seem like he came before World War II? <laughs> Architects of the Holocaust. Auschwitz doctor and angel of death, Josef Mengele, the former head of the Lyon Gestapo, Klaus Barbie, otherwise known as the Butcher of Lyon, or Ante Pavelic, Croatian founder of the Nazi collaborating Ustasche, the US Counterintelligence Corps, which was informed about the identity of the perpetrators, helped with the escape. In Barbie, they had found one of their top assets in the hunt for communists. With the help of the Americans, Barbie managed to escape to Bolivia where he would play a key role in hunting down Che Guevara. Four years earlier... Dude, it, for the record, once again, NATO in its inception, he's describing anti-communist sentiment that Americans and the American State Department is looking for in the immediate aftermath of World War II. Understand that this is specifically Americans working to find the best commie hunters okay immediately immediately after world war ii was like all right it's time to actually get our shit in gear and go after the real prize here <clears throat> klaus barbie should have been up in the gallows for fuck's sake the guy's appalling even for a fucking nazi yes cic man vincent la vista had described the vatican as the quote largest single organization involved in the illegal movement of emigrants through so-called rat lines, Nazis would be smuggled out of Germany through Switzerland to South America, for instance. All with the knowledge of the church, the Swiss government, and president of Argentina, Juan Perón. With companies such as the predecessor of the Swiss corporation, Emschemi, actively collaborating in this endeavor. But things didn't stop there. Describing denazification simply as a series of government mistakes or slackness misses the point. In order to fight the danger of communism from without and within Germany, among other things, the West German government saw great benefits in not only sparing the Nazis, but in reintegrating them in the state apparatus. Accordingly, the Nazi ideology continued to have significant influence in the power structure. Anti-communism, which was strongly intertwined with anti-Semitism, served the needs of the new regime. In particular, it was the Phantom of the Red Orchestra, which influential Nazis took over from the Gestapo. Communist resistance to Hitler was unquestionably labeled as treason, and it was successfully insinuated that it was now having a stronger effect in the Federal Republic of Germany. It's important to remember that many representatives of the ruling classes in other countries didn't have a problem with fascism in general but only where fascism endangered their own sphere of influence. Communism was the main danger to capitalism, and fascism was correctly regarded as an effective tool against communist influence. Quote, Fascism has rendered a service to the whole world. Hereafter, no great nation will be unprovided with an ultimate means of protection against the cancerous growth of Bolshevism. <clears throat> Um, I bet this guy has no idea about Molotov ribbon trop, though, you know, just saying. See, here's the thing, okay? Churchill, not a great guy, okay? But I'm not going to sit here and be like, uh, he didn't do some great things against the Nazis, okay? That's it. That, that's the point. When you're talking about, when you're talking specifically about uh, uh, what people did in World War II, okay? It's an entirely different point with an ultimate means of protection against the cancerous growth of Bolshevism, said Winston Churchill in a speech he gave in Rome in 1927. So instead of describing denazification as a failure... I, he's actually, I think, am I wrong? I think this is Madison Square Garden. That is a Jewish man in New York. Um, this is from Madison Square Garden in the United States of America, which is ironic because he's talking about Nazis in Germany. But... This is uh, the, the famous, um, the, the, the uh, fuck, what is it called? The, the, the American-German uh, Bund movement uh, rally that happened. Night at, night at Madison Square Garden is the, uh, Night of the Garden is the actual uh, name of the documentary, where this is a Jewish protester that protests against the Nazis, and the police actually arrested him, by the way. 
we have to see the adoption of fascism as a logical consequence of class society. Whether it's fascism in the form of an actual government system, or the use of the fascist movement in the service of capital, e.g. either actively collaborate Oh, yes, that's such a good take that I forgot to mention. Of course, the American-German Bund movement uh, had to Americanize and like somewhat anglicize their uh, narrative because they wanted to support Nazi Germany, right? So they, and this might come as a surprise to you, maybe you weren't aware of this, like you weren't following during the early stages of the Trump uh, era where I was covering this exact thing, but they tailored their uh, messaging around like, you know, George Washington and understandable white supremacist elements within American formation. And they literally were the first to say America first. Like they popularized the America first narrative where they were like, no, like America first. Like we love America. That's why you need to sign. Uh, uh, that's why you need to, to go to war alongside Nazi Germany, not against Nazi Germany. Yeah. Waiting with the Freikorps or the Fasci to crush communists or just integrating fascist elements in the state apparatus, such as the police, whether consciously or unconsciously, to secure a counter-revolutionary basis for the worst case. In other words, you cannot denazify class society. But this deeper causation and involvement of much wider forces in society was left aside, of course, in the World War II aftermath. Fritz Bauer, the attorney general who set the Auschwitz trial in motion, spoke of the atomization and parceling of the collective event, which had thus been diffused and privatized. This is reflected in the punishing of a relatively minuscule selective set of people, the tip of the iceberg. Take all the companies and their bosses who had financed Hitler's rise to power, who collaborated with the Nazi regime and profited from forced labor and mass murder in the concentration camps, the Tussens, the Flicks, the Quants, the Porsche Piechs, the Oetkers, most of them faced little to zero consequences. Industrialist Tyson Günther Krupp. Quant, whose ex-wife was married to Josef Goebbels, expanded the family wealth at the expense of concentration camp prisoners or through expropriating competitors. My family was in the German military industrial complex during the entire period. There were no penalties. The companies produced screws and nails from 1945 to 1955. And today they are producing tanks again. Exactly. That is the second, the, the, this video is great, but there's also a, a really insidious second thing that is happening right now in Germany specifically, which he started off talking about with the AFD revitalizing that fascist sentiment, right? In a country that uh, has a not so distant history with literally this exact same thing. The German military industrial complex is currently growing once again. And once you have a robust military industrial complex, that necessitates more imperialism, more bloodshed, more war. And that is fucking terrifying. Mostly Jewish. And became a major producer of armaments and industrial goods, boosting the war machine of the Third Reich. However, no charges were brought against him at the Nuremberg trials, despite initial investigations. The Quants are the wealthiest family in Germany today. Among the roughly 100 most powerful businessmen who virtually ruled over West German capitalism in the 60s, a majority were the same people as before 1945, people who should have been punished for war crimes. I will dive deeper into the collaboration between capitalists and Hitler in a future video. Nazism this, Nazism that, Nazis, Nazis, Nazis. The West German ruling class <laughs> got sick of hearing about denazification over and over. They've had enough of it. Schluss mit Entnazifizierung, end denazification, was a campaign slogan of the FDP, which is part of the so-called center-left government coalition in Germany today. <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, social fascism, baby. It's, it's interesting that, that, you know, that same coalition also existed in the lead up as well fdp are neoliberals not center left i mean please germany's only growing their military again because of our policy they actively resisted for a long time i mean after a certain point after a certain point you you have to remember uh it, it's not even necessarily like america giving the go-ahead or america influencing it's capital owners that want to make money this is an opportunity to generate revenue okay 
But the big winner of the 1949 election was... FDP was never left. They are neoliberal with a marginal social liberal wing. Yeah, they're the, they're the gay conservatives. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't know enough about the FDP. Another party, Konrad Adenauer from the conservative Christian... He meant center-left with Greens and SPD are as so-called left and FDP as center, but it's all liberal labeled, all three of them being... Uh, all three of them are right-wing. Democratic Union, short CDU, was elected as the first chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany. The CDU is the largest conservative party in Germany. President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, is a member. A year later, in 1950, Adenauer and former officers met in Himmeroth Abbey to lay out the conditions for the rearmament of Western Germany, releasing war criminals, putting an end to the defamation of the former soldiers, and the need to change public opinion regarding the Wehrmacht. US President Eisenhower, who had previously called the Wehrmacht soldiers Nazis, would suddenly change his opinion, perpetuating the clean Wehrmacht myth and supporting the rearmament efforts, not least because the Yankees needed strong partners in the Korean War and in the fight against communism more broadly. The US soon deemed denazification as counterproductive and agreed with Adenauer in ending denazification efforts. The chancellor said that the- Like, in my opinion, doing this, liberals who fucking, liberals who fucking uh, oftentimes like talk about, uh, you know, appeasement from the USSR without mentioning appeasement from the West uh, to Nazi Germany, always suspiciously never mention, never mention obviously what happened during World War II, but then also what happened after World War II, which is when this becomes infinitely less acceptable. Like you took all of the fucking genocidal freaks and war criminals and you put them in positions of power because they were rabidly anti-Soviet, anti-socialist, anti-trade unionist sickos. You did that knowing full well what they had done. You did that specifically because you wanted them to do that again if the scary communist boogeyman ever returned, if the specter kept haunting Europe, okay? The specter of communism. The main culprits had already been prosecuted. After all, there were much bigger problems than Nazis in Germany in the eyes of the new German government. Stoking the fear of the Red Menace, Adenauer would say, quote, In a moment, you will hear a cabinet resolution that we passed this morning, the aim of which is to ruthlessly remove all supporters of communism from positions in the Federal Republic, whether they are workers, employees, or civil servants. The context was a resolution yeah, sure, Hassan, that's the reason. Oh, I remember why I... Oh, shush, Hassan, you're not German. Ah, I remember why I find these streams so exhausting. Yeah, sure, Hassan, that's the reason. What was the reason for why America actually put Nazis in positions of power in Western Germany? Can you give me the brilliant five-head take that you have for it? Hassan, you must understand... You must, you must be German to understand the intricacies of uh, allowing Nazis into positions of power in your government... Is, is a fucking sick question. Uh, unless, I mean, sick take, unless you're like... Because they had military experience. Oh! Oh, what was the what was the military experience that they had? Who was it against? Military experience fighting who? This is yet another incredible moment where you just repeated exactly what I said in a sarcastic way in, in this, like, super asinine, cynical way where you're like, <laughs> no shit, the Americans? The Americans? I think there was military experience against uh, another group of individuals as well that the Americans actually cared more about. Think about it. Considering that the Americans were the ones who were putting them back in power. Think about it. Yeah, I mean, this is like declassified shit. Nazis and Axis collaborators, this is from CIA.gov. Nazis and Axis collaborators were used to further U.S. anti-communist objectives in Europe. Some immigrated to the United States. Leftist conspiracy equals declassified CIA take always. But this kind of stuff is like really, this kind of stuff is really shitty because like this isn't, this is more so uh, like deliberate omission from uh, most normal like most of the uh, areas where you could get your education from. 
and that's where the problem lies. Like, this is the same energy as, like, not knowing MLK was a socialist, not knowing uh, Einstein was a socialist. It's because it is purposely emitted from the record, despite these people openly stating their political ideologies. And when people... And when uh, uh, people don't learn about it, and enough people don't learn about it because they've learned a whitewash perspective and they think they understand it, they think uh, that, you know, the, the other side is significantly scarier, they make justifications for it. It's, this, this is where cognitive biases uh, come into play. Like, you have learned a different history that is, you've learned an incorrect assessment of history, an incorrect retelling of history, and you think that there is no top of the hour ad break. Your bias is kicked in. There is one, okay? And if you want to eviscerate or liberate yourself from the top of the hour ad break, all you need to do is subscribe for $5 or for free with a Twitch Prime or by getting gifted a sub if you're lucky. All right? Here's a three-minute ad break now. ...that the new government passed in 1950 called the Decree Against Enemies of the Constitution or the so-called Adenauer Decree. While it's worded neutrally, its thrust was clear. Of the organizations named in it, 11 are communist, but only two are right-wing extremists. The decree was the prelude to further legal measures against the left-wing opposition. Adenauer targeted not only the Communist Party of Germany and its sympathizers, but also popular resistance to the remilitarization that he sought. While persecuting communists, Nazis were slowly but surely led back to occupying key positions in the new German state. Not only did the denazification stop, but it was deemed as having gone too far. So, one of the first things that the Adenauer administration did was to pass amnesty laws, reducing the sentences of around 800,000 people or even setting them free. Including this is why I get frustrated whenever people talk about NATO without, like, the historical development of NATO, the express purpose as to why NATO was developed, like, and why if you are a leftist, like, you're, you're, uh, you claim to be a leftist and yet you are a, uh, like, rigid NATO defender, okay? You don't have to be pro-Russia. I am not, okay? I'm not pro-Vladimir Putin by any means, but... The, the idea that you're like, uh, you claim to be a socialist online and yet you're a, an ardent supporter of NATO is, is so insane to me. Including thousands of SA, SS and Nazi party members who had been convicted for assault or murder and for actively taking part in the transportation of victims to concentration camps. Among the many Nazi military leaders who were reintegrated into the West German army was Adolf Heusinger, who had served as an operations chief in the Wehrmacht. He later became the head of the West German military and the chairman of the NATO military committee. The chief of staff of the German chancellery, the quote, left and right hand of Adenauer, Hans Globke, had written the commentary on the Nuremberg race laws, which determined who was a Jew thus deciding who was persecuted and who was locked up in concentration camps. He now said, quote, The German people knew as little as I did. Then there were those Nazis who were key people in the foundation of international bodies, such as Walter Hallstein, who became one of the founding fathers of the European Union, and Kurt Waldheim, who became Secretary General of the United Nations and President of Austria. And, of course, there were Nazis in the universities as well. Historian and fierce anti-Semite Werner Konze is among them, but also the rector of the University of Freiburg and one of the most influential German philosophers, Martin Heidegger. Heidegger never apologized for his support of the Nazis. He joined the party in 1933 and remained there until the bitter end. After 1945, there was a massive campaign to salvage Heidegger's reputation, claiming that he had been critical of the Nazis all along, but that he couldn't state it openly. All of that fell apart in 2014. <laughs> uh, it's so good. Yeah, dude, I, I really... I, I promise, I was like super critical, dog. Like, I promise. The latest, when the black notebooks were released. And let's not forget the so-called assault gun of democracy, one of the biggest German news magazines, Der Spiegel, co-designed for far too long by old men of the Nazi regime. 
One of the vice editors in chief was a certain Georg Wolf, former SS Hauptsturmführer and SA member. These examples are only a fraction of all the Nazis holding powerful positions in the police, in government, and all the ministries, or in the judicial system. And don't get the wrong impression that Nazis only occupied supportive secondary offices. No. They were part of the highest echelons of power. The later Chancellor of Germany, Kurt Georg Kiesinger, had been a Nazi party member from 1933. Kiesinger would accelerate the reintegration of Nazis and would successfully campaign against the banning of the NPD, a neo-Nazi party that exists to this day. Meanwhile, the Communist Party of Germany was banned. It's odd that, like, uh, you know, instead of denazifying, they decommunistified further, which was Hitler's intention from the jump, uh, you know, both cleaning his own party of anyone who with, had a trade unionist or socialist or communist opinions, okay? But then also the rest of the country, as a matter of fact. So it's very cool that the... It's very cool that time and time again, post-World War II, you see this exact same strategy being applied in the Western world, right? Canada uh, uh, takes in an influx of refugees from, from uh, you know, different parts of Eastern Europe that align with the Nazis with the express purpose of trying to change the, the uh, diaspora culture to be anti-Soviet, anti-socialist uh, in general, Okay. Uh, same thing happens in Germany. It's it's very similar to uh, you know destroying uh, Reconstruction era uh, social harmony or trying to uh, develop social harmony and reinstituting the same social hierarchy, racial hierarchy that existed. Okay. And in 1956, the second and last ban in the history of the Federal Republic followed by over 125,000 prosecutorial investigations and around 10,000 convictions, reaffirming that within a bourgeois democracy, the communist is seen as a far greater danger than the Nazi. I'll talk more about the persecution of communists and the broader left. Why do you compare Soviets with socialism? Unbelievable bullshit. You're right. You're so right. Yeah, why would I do that? Well, I'm not the one doing that. They were the ones doing that. You understand that, right? In the eyes of a fascist or a capitalist collaborator with fascists who see fascism as a way better mechanism of organizing society, there is no difference between trade unionists, socialists, or if you're in America, I guess Democratic Party members or liberal, kind of. You know what I mean? So how can you look at like a historical analysis... Of, of how Nazism survived in Germany and how all of these Western countries uh, uh, post-World War II considered Soviets, uh, uh, trade unionists, anyone who had like any allegiance towards communism or socialism or the USSR to be in the same in-group. Is this what you're... Is this what your, your perspective is? Trade unions are banned in the USSR. Oh my God, I'm going to die, dude. I'm not talking about the USSR, man. I'm talking about the Western understanding of like any kind of movement towards even uh, building social democratic principles beyond uh, what was allowed by uh, Americans and capitalists and the capital owner class in European countries. You're trying to do like sectarian infighting for like 1958 Germany. I, I don't know what to do with you, man. I, I don't know what's going on. How are you this fucking horny? In Western Germany and the next part. With the exception of Gustav Heinemann, all German presidents from Theodor Heuss to Roman Herzog were contaminated by National Socialism. They had been either members of the Nazi party or the Wehrmacht and included a concentration camp. Like, how do you look at a situation like this and not think, wow, it's pretty fucked up? And your immediate reaction is like, well, the USSR was bad. They didn't let trade unions exist. Like, that's, what we're, that's, that's, your, that's your main point of contention here? Yeah. Unlike in Nazi Germany, they were very fond of trade unionists, you know, specifically. Like, what, what do you, what, what's the argument? What are we doing? You think, they were, you think these guys fucking did not facilitate in executing them? They did. And they didn't even get fucking punished. Builder 
or a profiteer from forced labor in those camps. And it wasn't only guys from the conservative parties. Rabbit anti-communist SPD chancellor from... <laughs> Soviet forklift operators over the ones I've worked with? <laughs> 1974, Helmut Schmidt had received seven Nazi awards for his engagement in Hitler's army and had also been described by superiors as having a quote, impeccable national socialist attitude. Wait, also, you can have critiques of like uh, mismanagement of labor, but um, like, I, I think the USSR did have uh, trade unions. You know, that's like there were other issues, but I don't know. I, I don't know what your what your critique is in that situation. In general, in Europe, um, you keep hearing that everything is immigrants' fault, not enough houses, uh, care getting expensive, but also you talk about how there aren't enough people to do jobs and people should, and we should get Eastern European immigrant workers. Thanks for educating people about this. People will need it when in two to six years the AfD-CDU co coalition will take over Germany once again and hate crime all the minorities. AFD-CDU coalition, but AFD specifically in Germany, um, the Italian leadership has already uh, fallen to literal fascists. And Marine Le Pen is coming uh, to France as well in the next election cycle. Okay? So that's three major power players in Europe. No, I don't care about Orban. Like... Whenever people say, like, whoa, what about Viktor Orban? Like, no, nobody gives a shit about fucking uh, Hungary, okay? Like, I'm talking about actual countries that matter in the, in the European Union formation. Like, you know, not like, not countries that have, you know, symbolic uh, opinions and are ashamed of being Turkic in origin because they're Christian, so they're different now, okay? Like, give Hungary back to Turkey. Let's, you know, let's, let's, let's be done with this conversation, okay? Forcible Islamization of Hungary and, and uh, put it under the Turkish control once again, where it deserves to be. Okay? Do I really think Le Pen is going to win? Yes, I do. Dude, there are libs in here that don't understand jokes? No. Uh, I mean, all jokes aside, like, Germany, especially Germany, but like, yes, France, Italy, but especially Germany is really important for the European Union. Okay. Um, the German industry uh, refocusing on on the military industrial complex or uh, building uh, a larger military industrial complex is a genuine problem. Uh, German sympathies uh, growing, G uh, fascist sympathies growing in Germany is a massive problem. Germany is the economic engine that drives the European Union, okay? It's fucking terrifying. Actually terrifying. You are joking, but Orban attends summits of organization of Turkic states? Yeah, dude, are you kidding me? The, the white nationalist fake fucking uh, Putin supporter uh, who relies on EU giving its state money to exist is never going to be like, yeah, let's go and join the Turkic states. Like, he's not... You know, you can already see that. Oh, uh, the Cavernical came to my defense here. How is this post left, or how how is this post left, or how is he he's wrong? Are we going to say that Vietnam invading Cambodia to get rid of Pol Pot was the destruction of Khmer culture or something? It's just super reactionary mindset of well, if someone says China is better than the alternative, then they must be a tanky simp. I'm not even defending China's actions towards its neighbors overall, but I'm not going to start crying about Tibetan slavery ending. I think it's the problem with people who don't know history. Look at it through there. At least keep it. Real propagandized view of the past is like the Korean War too. Who is bad and good is based on current current politics and not history based take as well. Are Scandinavian countries also falling to fascism as well? Um, I don't know enough. Uh, I know that Sweden has uh, a lot of uh, you know that Hitlerite particle. Uh, they got that dog in them in certain parts of uh, Swedish politics, but. I don't know enough about, I don't know enough about Finland. Uh, I do know a little bit about Finnish history. Okay. Um, I don't know about Norway. I feel like, no, Anders Breivik is a, is a fucking singular psychopath. I, like he, he did not represent a broader 
Norwegian movement of like white nationalists, white supremacist psychos. Listen, um, my point is, or my opinion is oftentimes if you can, if you can maintain uh, a robust social safety net, as long as you can like offer amenities and like offer welfare, or some, some level of like social safety nets to the people, it's going to be a little bit harder to, to implement that uh, fascist spark in the population. If you look to, if you look to the economies or the happiness metrics, which are kind of silly in most cases, but like if you look to the confidence that people have in their governments, um, in, in countries that have, larger social safety nets whose economies have not been uh whose economies have not suffered there is less reactionary momentum but there still is reactionary momentum because like no matter what happens social democracy still fall into that same capitalist trap where there is still always going to be uh an erosion of said social safety nets but there is always going to be a need. There's always going to be people who want to privatize certain aspects of, of uh, the economy or further privatize it uh, and, and try to erode mechanisms of regulation and control on the free market because capitalists always want more profits. And the best way to do that is by starving the beast. Neoliberalism, like you saw under the Thatcher administration, but also the Reagan administration. So when that happens... Oh my God, dude. Why couldn't you explain this to Ethan? I did. Okay, I'm banning motherfuckers who still want to do debate pervetry in here. You are not a fan of mine. You are not a fan of the truth. You are just in here specifically to try to get me to eat debate and 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 get mad at you and say so you can clip it and derail the conversation. It's very unproductive. Um, so yeah, as I said, like reactionary movements growing in attitude in Sweden especially, uh, a, a, lot, a lot of people will tell you it happened due to like migrant Muslims, right? Whereas those reactionary movements started growing before uh, there was uh, a, a massive war on terror and a refugee crisis caused by it. It actually started with the erosion of social safety nets. It predates Muslim migration. It's never about migration. Never. It's always, it's always the erosion of material conditions and people getting angry about said realities, and then uh, this creating a perfect environment to like focus your efforts on uh, something else, an external force, and that's how nationalism and fascist fervor rises. Okay, that's how that's how America is so fucking psychotically fascist and and nationalist as well. Think about it this way. Joe Brandon's uh, Bidenomics. Joe Brandon's uh, America. Look at inflation. It's sky high. Look at the immigrants. They're coming over. They're fucking destroying our culture and our society. It's like, no, they're not. There is no, there is no, uh, uh, there is no immigrant scourge that is destroying this country. Okay. Not immigrants. It's not even AI. You said AI is? No, it's not AI either. It's capital owners. It always has been. It is the bourgeois. Okay. Always has been. Always will be until we evolve away from the formerly necessary economic organization of society that you call capitalism. There was a point in time when the bourgeois revolutions and capitalism was demonstrably better in collectivizing, okay, and was demonstrably better than the prior formation of feudalism. But now, under our current global organization of the economy, we have moved back towards neo-feudalism, Instead of the, the uh, internal contradictions that exist under a capitalist organization of the economy inevitably uh, creating an impasse that paves the way to a more evolved understanding, which I would call socialism. As MLK said, capitalism has outlived its usefulness. Absolutely. It absolutely has. Do you think that North African immigrants coming into Europe share the same values as Western Europeans? Um, yes, you racist fucking piece of shit. They do, okay? They want to put food on their tables. They want to have clothes on their backs. They want to have shelter. They want to exist in a world where they can do fulfilling labor. They want to be emotionally and mentally stimulated. 
Yes, they do. Unless you think that North African immigrants are somehow different. Well, I'll just ask you questions. I wanted to know what you thought. Come on, dog. I can spot a fucking idiotic, biased, racist-ass fucking comment like this from a mile away. If you truly believed in, uh, if, you were, if you were actually on the other side, the opposing side of this, instead of doing the cynical, just asking questions uh, type shit, because you are a pussy, just like you are a racist, most racists are pussies at the end of the day, you wouldn't have asked it in this way. You would have said, you would have said why do you think pussy-ass racists claim that North African immigrants coming into Europe have different values than Western Europeans when that is not the case. But you didn't say it like that. You said it in the way that you did because you're a pussy and you're afraid that people are going to call you a fucking Nazi. Don't try to backtrack out of it. Just be fucking real. So you think they align on everything. Now you are moving the goalpost and saying they have to align on every single thing. Okay. Every single person here who understands their class position is more aligned with an immigrant that also understands their class position and unified on the same fucking uh, unified on the same agenda that we must uplift uh, we must uplift all material conditions for all workers across the world than a fucking Nazi little shit like you because you at the end of the day will be a loyal foot soldier to capital owners while you won't even get cut into the fucking profits. Do you understand? So I have more aligned with people like that than I do with you. When push comes to shove, you will turn around and you will be a foot soldier, a loyal foot soldier to those who do not have your material interest at heart. A dog. A rabid one that will inevitably be put down. Just asking questions, dude. Like, I haven't been fucking dealing with, like, cynical online Nazis who always do, like, these just asking questions shit. Yeah. Jacking off in the chat. Just take a moment to digest this. This isn't just utilizing a few former Nazi members for their know-how. This isn't just marginal elements of Nazism that survived. This is structural. A certain Otto Jon, who was the first chief of the German Domestic Intelligence Agency, had enough and ranted against the quote, That was a normie Dutch person's opinion about North Africans? Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's just like, okay, ask a fucking normie American their perspective on, their opinion on like, I don't know, Guatemalan migrants coming into America or Haitian migrants coming into America. They are going to be blinded by vitriolic racialized hatred i already described where that vitriolic racial racialized hatred comes from and how it's weaponized and how it's utilized the anger that you feel is towards those who actually control all mechanisms of society it is not the random person that is coming into this country with only clothes on his back and maybe a fucking iphone to make a better future for himself okay for his family it is actually the bosses that cut your salary. It is the bosses that steal your surplus labor value. It is not the immigrant coming over the border. You and him have the same exact fucking interests. You want to have clothes on your back. You want to have shelter over your head. You want to eat food, okay? That's it. You want to put food on your fucking table. Those are your interests. And the only way to achieve said interests is by working. Okay? By becoming a wage laborer. In West Germany. And then quit his job. His successor was a former Nazi. But more on that next time. Professor Albert Norden from the GDR published the seminal Brown Book in 1965, covering around 2,000 powerful people in Western Germany with a Nazi past including 100 admirals and generals, 15 ministers, 828 judges or state attorneys, 245 officials in the foreign office and at embassies, 297 high police officers and members of the so-called Verfassungsschutz. I have to pee chat. The Constitution. This one is important. I'll be back in a second. We'll talk about the Verfassungsschutz in the next part. The West German government seized the book on a book fair and claimed that it was all falsification and, quote, 
communist propaganda. However, the communist propaganda in question turned out to be largely correct. And bit by bit, research in the coming decades would uncover more and more about the Nazi structures existing within the Federal Republic. The response of the West German government was to point out how Nazis were reintegrated in the East as well. And you'll hear this line of defense today as well from liberals and conservatives. What about East Germany, they'll ask. Now to be sure, it is true that former NSDAP members found their way into the East German state as well. But the comparison is laughable. Denazification in the Soviet zone had been a much higher priority, even to the point of being criticized as being too harsh. Large landowners and the so-called Junkers, who were also often former Nazi supporters, were quickly expropriated in the East, while West German parties started to urge the Allied powers to stop denazification. It was not until years later when the West German politicians started pointing the finger back to the East. In fact, a huge amount of Nazis fled to the West convinced they would get away with much less punishment. And they were right. A total of 12,890 sentences were passed in East Germany, almost double the number in the West, despite East Germany having less than one-third of the population of West Germany, and that despite the massive transfer of Nazis from East to West. Former Nazis in East Germany were six to seven times more likely to be prosecuted and found guilty than their Western counterparts. Furthermore, not only were former Nazis more likely to be prosecuted in East Germany, but they also faced much harsher punishments if convicted. And lastly, Nazis were represented to a much larger degree at the very top of the political and economic hierarchy than in the East. And this will become very clear throughout this series. In the German Democratic Republic, individuals recognized as fighters or victims of fascism were provided with additional pensions and other privileges as a way to acknowledge their suffering. It feels like these kinds of people are all over this platform. Every time you're pro-humanity, you got called a communist or dumbass when really it's all about treating people equally. It's really heartbreaking. There's so many people who don't give a shit about other people's standard of living. What the fuck is wrong with them? Um, they're just lashing out in anger. I appreciate you going over these topics. I remember some of these topics from AP World History, but the curriculum moves so fast, and sometimes we didn't get to all the context. Thank you. I can't speak on AP curriculum, AP history, because I, I didn't go to school in America. Um, but uh, I, I suspect that they don't cover it from this perspective at all. I'll be honest with you. that You're not going to see a lot of, of uh, even sympathetic points of opinion even if historical, uh, historically accurate assessments are technically sympathetic to that position in uh, American schooling, I would say. I don't think that that happens. On the other hand, Nazis were granted generous pensions in the West, while those who had fought against the Nazis and were interned in concentration camps received no pensions for those periods because they were considered not to have made the necessary contributions during that time. Now, I, I promise you in my history book, there was a section on Marx with so many sections mentioning how controversial and unpopular ideas were. Yeah, I think, you know how I've talked about the different tiers? How I've talked about the different tiers of transphobia and how like it becomes a mental illness? And the final uh, stage of that mental illness is demonstrated within uh, transvestigations, right? Uh, a similar thing can be said for anti-socialist sentiment as well. And I think one of the most advanced forms of anti-socialist sentiment is when you attribute like some policies from uh, Mao or Stalin to Karl Marx, when you say that, you've like reached a level of of 17 head consciousness where you're just like, anyone that's ever said sharing is caring is actually responsible for famines, which of course, uh, you know, still exists under capitalism, but then it's the human beings that are just uh, 
L nerds who aren't picking themselves up by their bootstrap straps hard enough that are just dying to famine related diseases. 14 million to be exact every single year under a global capitalist organization of society where technological improvements have created a surplus of food supply and, and not like a scarcity as uh, ones that existed in other lesser developed, uh, less technologically advanced societies was they were, de- where they were desperately trying to collectivize. Uh, in the course of a short period of time. <sighs> okay. I have my criticism of the GDR's development over the decades, and this will likely be the subject of another video. What I want to stress here is that this deflection to the East is a cheap excuse to distract from the very real and consequential problems existing It's not existing worldwide. 14 million is, uh, I mean, 14 Many million is worldwide, not the U.S. that modern so-called United Germany is a new third thing it's not. The Bundesrepublik Deutschland is the state apparatus of West Germany. And yet, liberals are perpetually in a rush to demonize the specter of communism for all their problems, including the rise of the AFD. But this will be discussed in one of the next parts. SS <laughs> Commander Herbert Kapp- <laughs> that That's my favorite meta. Uh, is, is being like, yeah, uh, actually Nazism is rising in, in these countries, like, or fascist, fascism is rising in these countries uh, because people are fighting it too hard. And that is literally just pre-World War II era liberalism played over again. Like, what are we doing? This is why the never again concept has to also feature more of like the buildup to the never again moment. It's like, oh, really? That's crazy. We were fighting the Nazis too hard. That's why. That's why, like, uh, you know, they got galvanized in their position. That's crazy. Maybe you shouldn't been you shouldn't have been such a fucking pussy at the time, and also join the fight against the Nazis to make sure that they don't fucking thrive. Nope. Never mind. Kapler, who was head of German police and security services in Rome during the war, had organized a massacre of 335 Italians in 1944 by shot in the neck. For this, he was sentenced to life imprisonment in Italy. What is less well known is how politicians like the Social Democrat Chancellor Willy Brandt campaigned for his pardon. Brandt's goal was to pursue a policy of so-called internal reconciliation, reconciling former Nazi followers and opponents of the Third Reich. The West German government appealed for a release of Kappler, which the Italian authorities denied. However, in 1976, he was transferred to a hospital. Yeah, the Italian authorities are too busy doing, like, Illuminati fuck parties. NATO-aligned Illuminati fuck parties that, uh, you know, and, and sending fucking mail bombs and shit, you know? It, real cool stuff the Italian authorities were doing. Good thing that, you know, fascism would never actually rise in Italy again, right? Obviously. I mean, that'd be crazy. He managed to escape, likely with the help of a carabinieri. Despite calls for his extradition back to Italy, the West German authorities refused and did not prosecute Kappler for any additional war crimes, citing his poor health as the reason. Kappler... You're glad to re- see a return to theory terms? This is not even theory. This is just regular history, um, European history that is like the secret dark side of European history that oftentimes many Americans or many Westerners in general are completely oblivious to. And I do think that it's a necessity because, like, for far too long, a lot of liberals have thrived in this community or rather have not, like, really re-examined their position at all. Died peacefully in 1978. (laughs) And it was not until decades later, after most of the Nazi party members had died in peace, when the West German authorities made a half-hearted effort to investigate re-Nazification. A 2012 study by the Federal Ministry of Justice itself found that a whopping 77% of its senior officials in 1957 were former NSDAP members, more than researchers expected. And their number even increased after 1949. Historians also found that, up to the 70s, over 80% of top judicial officials had worked in Hitler's justice apparatus, among them those who had handed down death sentences during the Holocaust. And in 2014, almost 70 years after the fall of Hitler, the Federal Ministry of the Interior also finally commissioned a group of historians to investigate its past. 
with depressing results. <laughs> Between 1949 and 1970, the proportion of former Nazi members was 54%. Among them, the lawyer Gerhard Scheffler, who had already served in the Reich uh -oh. Ministry of the Interior in the 30s. During the war, he was responsible for the Germanization of businesses and organized the deportation of Poles and Jews to ghettos. He reappeared in 1950 in the Federal Ministry It's just a oopsie. Yeah, ja, it's just a oopsie. Das ist, das ist ein uh, major oopsie. Yeah, it's, it's a mistake. I mean, who amongst us, you know? Oopsie. Interior. From 1955, as head of the social department, where he was instrumental in preparing the... Oh my god, ich kann nicht glauben. Das ist ein Oopsie. Ist Oopsie, ja? Ein großes Versehen. Oh, großes Oopsie, ja? Not good. Sozialhilfegesetz, the Federal Social Assistance Act. So, this of course had a great impact on German politics. The most striking case was that of the head of the Residence and Asylum Law Department, Kurt Breul, who had never abandoned his fundamental anti-Semitic attitude and who was then responsible for rejecting Jews who had fled from Germany. Not it's gross that it's taking you this long to do a German accent. True. I don't usually deploy it, but, you know, 25 minutes of fucking seeing <laughs> no Nazi, <laughs> seeing so many Nazis not get punished in Germany and instead get celebrated and also... Uh, put into positions of power. This video didn't even feature like the NATO side of things for the record. It just straight up was just talking about, um, it just straight up was talking about like Western Germany uh, <laughs> de -communi communist thing instead of uh, denazifying. But there is that component as well, which also, in my opinion, plays a role alongside this as well. Like this is how it was done. But that this is the ministry which is tasked with the quote unquote protection of democracy and things such as media and cultural policy. Regarding the Nazis that were reintegrated into the Federal Foreign Office, Adenauer said, quote, You can't build a foreign office if you don't have people, at least initially in the senior positions, who understand something about the history of the past. Out of 17 diplomats who sat in the political department at the time, 13 had previously held NSDAP party membership cards. Before you say, uh, I'm starting to think Germany's just waiting at this point, that's not true. That's not fair, at least. Because just like in the buildup, in the lead up to the Nazi party taking power, there were plenty of fucking awesome Germans who were fighting against said uh, Nazi uh, uh, consolidation of power, okay? There were. And there are plenty of Germans to this day who carry on that torch. The problem is those in positions of power oftentimes avoid them or purposely push them aside or, you know, have their own McCarthyist uh, trial style uh, uh, movement in Germany, as you guys saw here. What? Maybe the NATO part is in your imagination, you know, because American exceptionalism or diabolism, if being accurate. Wait, that's so sick. That's crazy. The guy is back. He said, maybe the NATO part is in my imagination. No, it's not. It actually was featured in the video, just not as heavily featured as uh, one would. But here you go, man. It's so fucking easy. It's, Google is free. It's so easy. It's free 99. These NATO generals had unusual backgrounds. They served in the Third Reich. <laughs> like... <laughs> Yeah, it's the USSR bandy unions guy. Which, by the way, of course, of course, of course, you're adding American exceptionalism into that take. Yeah, I know. Listen, man, I, I guess smell where your narrative is coming from. Okay, the the Hassan is an American. Uh, Hassan is Hassan's foreign policy is just America bad. Is pure copium. Okay, it's pure copium coming from people who desperately want to say America good but are too big of a pussy to say it. Just say America good. You like America. You like any and everything that the United States of America has done, okay? Just say it. At least the conservative is honest, okay? The conservative is honest. The conservative is like a bloodthirsty monster. The reactionary is openly a bloodthirsty, vicious monster. 
The reactionary doesn't hide behind like the aesthetics of of uh, civility, liberalism, the aesthetic. Well, some conservatives do that too. The conservative reactionary does not hide behind the the auspices of anarchism. Okay, just say. You like America. It's okay. You live in America. You're selfish. It's fine. It's very, very frustrating to come in here and also present like it's not a zero one binary thing, motherfucker. Heard of nuance. Oh, notice how you got stomped harder than the neo Nazi heads that you're talking about. Literally, in this, in, in one immediate fucking Google search. And it took you two minutes to come back and try to drop a second line. Like, you didn't go, hey, you know what? Maybe you were right on that point. I am going to read and learn more about it. That's what a normal person does, okay? A normal person goes, hey, you know what? I'm a little bit out of my element here. I'm a little bit out of depth, okay? Well, you didn't do that. You didn't do that. And instead, you went along with... <laughs> What does NATO have to do with governance? Yes, dude, you're right. NATO, nothing to do with governance at all. That's not how that works at all. Yeah, just having like American military bases in your country has nothing to do with a demonstration of hard power and soft power simultaneously. It's just, you know, just for funsies. It's not a zero one binary thing, motherfucker. Herd of nuance is also a wonderful contribution to the discourse as well um go ahead explain to me the nuances of having nazis inside of nato like if your goal isn't to stomp out communism okay if you don't consider that to be a dangerous scary ideology which i assume if you've been a fucking 58 month subscriber you like at least have to have some allegiances to communism right socialism anarchism something like, so why do you defend an institution that was designed with the express purpose of murdering communists, socialists, trade unionists, and the like? Why? Especially when we just started this conversation with a fucking literal article that presents your perspective that, you know, the Waffen-SS... There's nuances to that. It's not immediately Nazi. Hold on, Kaya is barking. I think she opened the door again. Oh my God, you're a fucking freak. Oh my God, she opened the door on her own again. Oh my God, how? It's so heavy. How do you always open the door? Okay, go to bed. No, no, go to bed. Go to Fuck, dude. She's such a fucking freak. Dude, how do you open the bed? How do you do it? How do you, how do, you do it? Come, come here. How do you open the door? How? How? Crazy. If we are to believe German state propaganda, Germany successfully denazified society and established an effective memory culture, Erinnerungskultur, a culture of dealing with its Nazi past so as to not risk repeating history. As I hope to show with this video, as also confirmed by recent events, most of that narrative is bullshit. According to a poll, over half of Germans want to move on from remembering the country's Nazi past. Among AFD voters, it's 80%. A chilling 58% of the supporters of the increasingly successful far-right party further stated that Nazi Germany had its positives. But what about today? Surely, now that the old Nazis have died off, there's no chance that there's significant fascist influence in a democratic state yeah, of course not. Germany today. Well, Shit. you thought wrong. Almost fell. It was one structure in particular which would be Wait, that is what I thought. Fuck. in the West German state, being a core node of a secret counter-revolutionary Nazi network that's in existence. 
to this day. It is this crucial building block of the German capitalist bureaucracy I deliberately left out in this part because it deserves its own video. So, in the next part, we'll analyze the history of an organization led by none other than the former Wehrmacht general and Nazi military intelligence chief in the Eastern Front, a notorious hunter of communists, recruited by the CIA to build an organization that would turn into one of the most important anti-communist Wait, what's he talking about? In the world, the Organisation Gehlen. This was fire. Great video overall. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I don't understand. Um, is this guy trying to say that like a lot of hardline fascists who participated in the Holocaust were hired by the CIA to continue uh, doing at least some parts of the Holocaust? You know, the, the anti-socialist parts at least? Like, huh. Yeah, I don't get it, man. I feel like this guy, this guy's a little political, I think. Thank God Germany changed a lot of policies lately and made improves to protect the constitution and executive branch from Nazis. Oh, wait. Wait, what? Nazi symbols and child pornography found in German police chats. What? No way, dude. <laughs> What's next? Are you going to tell me that the German special forces had a significant Nazi problem so much so that they had to disband an entire unit? No! Stop it! What? No way, German disbands special forces group tainted by far right. Wait, what? What? No, no, stop, dude. What? what the fuck, yo, dude? Yo, that's crazy, dog. That's wild. Huh. That's damn. That shit is. <laughs> That, is that is called the oopsie, yeah? Oh my, oh my God, I can't believe That is a große oopsie. Oopsie. Oh, you were making a joke? Yeah, no, I know all of this shit. Yes, of course I'm fucking being obtuse to drive home a point that it's, uh, it's like when I give you, it's like when I give you a talking point in the chat and people will be like, oh, he's lying. He made that up. And then someone fucking Googles it or my editors will put the exact fucking data point corresponding to the thing I said in the YouTube video afterwards, just because I'm pulling it. And sometimes I don't get it entirely correct is like, obviously, especially when it comes to numbers, it, you know, it's a little hard. Oh, hopeless dude. I can't deal with you anymore. I didn't make it to five years in two months, five years. Two months missing, fuck you. Wait, why'd you ban him? Unban him. He can cry in the chat all he wants. If we let him cook any harder, he was going to start talking about the age of consent and horse day. <laughs> no, it's fine, dude. It's fine. Um, I just like, I feel like banning people like that pushes them even further in the, in the opposite direction. Yeah, he's breaking up with me because I said Americans purposefully put Nazis into positions of power um, and also allowed a period of no denazification to exist and did not crush that sentiment um, in, in Germany because they wanted to use it against the real enemy. That's, that in and of itself is just like historically accurate events. And instead of fucking looking at that and being like, maybe I should just, uh, I don't know, develop a, sp a sp different perspective. Like, please, man, please. All I ask for you all I ask for you, Russian disinfo is so effective. Wait, please stop. You don't think this is Russian disinformation, what I'm explaining, right? God, liberals. Oh, my Lord. I don't think that there's any way to, like, maybe, maybe there is no way to, like, actually fucking change uh, the minds of people when it's just so, so hornily made up. No, what is that? I don't get it. Like I, something so remotely, something is so remotely critical 
Oh, the USA these days, all of a sudden, it's just Russian and Chinese disinformation. To dick riding is unreal. Yeah, I know. Oh. Like, the real, the real argument here would be to say, actually, the USSR also did their own Operation Paperclip, which would be true. Like, you can just do that. Not to the same degree. Nowhere near as severe as the Americans did. Especially, no comparison on the on the Japanese side to what Americans did. Okay? But it's true. It's just... Yeah, he unfollowed, like, fucking five-year subscriber unfollowed because I said... Because I fucking showed him, starting off with this, we went on a journey and, and where I showed him that, yes, there were Nazis that the Americans in power put into position of power in NATO... And then he openly also said, well, it's because they had really good fighting experience. Like, at that point, it's just like cognitive bias is so powerful in your mind. Like, please re-examine. Okay? Please. I'm not saying be my biggest fan. I'm not saying agree with everything I'm saying. Okay? Just know that at the top of the hour, there's a three-minute ad break. And if you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe. For $5 or for free with Switch Prime. Okay? <laughs> It is a little sad, though. We get so worked up so much that people feel the need to announce their departure in this way. It's hard not to feel strong about politics, of course, but it's just sad because leftist infighting is more destructive than right-wing infighting. The right-wing doesn't need a majority to enact flash policy, but the left needs way more than a majority. It's so fucked. Yeah, but, like, a lot of those people just, like, move away from leftist organizing when they, like... It's not even get caught up in the minutia. Like, you can have a difference in opinion. Like, you can be like, oh, I'm a anarcho-syndicalist versus like you believe in more centralized control like that oftentimes yields uh ridiculous arguments and and leads to infighting but this is not even a, a, an infighting on a ridiculous point this is like trying to justify like trying to justify american imperialism post-world war ii that was also against his best interest if he's like if you are Personally, someone who considers themselves to be socialist and you find yourself defending the greatest anti-socialist organization that's ever existed. I, like, I don't know what to tell you. You're, and I give you historical evidence as to its formation and you just lash out at me. At that point, you're not interested in anything.